tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It's a nightmare. No new bookings, canceled reservations. What can be done to help local businesses hit hard by coronavirus? Also, frankly, it's evolved into a success story much quicker than even I expected. How Vancouver's Olympic Village went from ghost town to success story. <laughs> and Stop the invasion! Stop the invasion! Shut it down! Shut it down! A country divided by anger and resentment as protests over a BC pipeline cause more disruptions. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Well, it's been a week of declining business. Fear over coronavirus is hitting some local shops hard. Today, Metro Vancouver's Chinese community is looking for answers. And as Lian Young reports, the concern is the drop in customers is due to the spread of misinformation. No way can tell. In 40 years of business, this is the quietest it's ever been for Glynis Chan. It's a nightmare, terrible that uh, we don't have any new booking come to our business. And, but we are busy to cancel reservation. In the last month, Chan says she's just booked one new reservation. From the very beginning, I say I, my business dropped about 40%. But I can tell you now, I can drop to down to 70 to 90 percent. That devastating drop in business gave Chan a seat at this meeting between Vancouver's Chinese community and all three levels of government. Part of the discussion today was to, to talk about the local impacts uh, on business here. We've heard some restaurants that are losing 50, 60, 70 percent of, of business, uh, which is very, very concerning to us because most of it is based on misinformation. Many businesses, particularly in Richmond and Burnaby, are suffering because of fears and misinformation like this, that an employee at a restaurant was diagnosed or a grocery chain was linked to the virus. We are determined any time that there is a positive case to let people know. And we've consistently done that so people can be assured that that is going to happen every single time. There is a commitment to transparency by all of the elected officials who are working very closely with the departments of public health at all levels to make sure that we have credible information, that we understand the evolving science, and that we're actually communicating that to the best of our ability to Canadians as quickly as we get it. Chan is welcoming the transparency, but it's not going to help with cruise ship season just around the corner. The quarantine horror stories are keeping passengers at bay. But it's also a fad to the uh, restaurants, coach line company, tour guide, uh, you know, service, and all the retail shop. That's a big impact to our economy. Chan asked the government for help to stimulate tourism. She got an answer, sort of. But they will say, you know, make a consideration and try to do something for us. And did you think that was a good answer? Um, not really right to the point, but at least they hear from us. The fight against COVID-19 and its fallout is far from over. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. For a fourth straight day, China says there's been a drop in the number of coronavirus deaths. Today, the country is reporting 98 new deaths versus 106 yesterday. That brings the total number of deaths in China to 1,868. Meanwhile, more new infections have been reported, bringing the number of confirmed cases to more than 72,000. And a number of severe overdoses has led to a warning about a toxic batch of drugs in the interior. However, it's not clear which drugs are affected. The series of overdoses first started yesterday, and that prompted Interior Health to issue a warning to drug users. The agency has not released how many people have been affected or which drug was consumed, but it says the outcomes of the overdoses have been severe and that the drugs going around are toxic. People are being warned not to use drugs alone and to carry naloxone. Also, if it's possible, to use at an overdose prevention or supervised consumption site. A man is in critical condition after a bad crash in Surrey. A pickup truck hit a minivan and a small bus. The driver of the truck was airlifted to hospital. It all happened at 140th Street near 24th Avenue last night. None of the passengers in the other two vehicles needed to be hospitalized. And police say speed, alcohol and drugs have not yet been ruled out as causes.
Well, it's gone from ghost town to success story in less than 10 years. In its early days, Vancouver's Olympic Village was a highly controversial addition to the city. Jesse Johnston looks at how the neighborhood grew from a financial disaster into the thriving community it now is. Ten years ago, when the games were in full swing and these buildings were filled with athletes, this is where Olympians came to pray. That's right, the Olympic non-denominational faith space Everything is, hallowed. is now a liquor store. It's fitting this was once a holy site because the athletes' village once required much faith from taxpayers. When the financing deal for the developer fell apart in 2008, the city took on $690 million in debt to ensure the village would be ready in time for the Olympics. The project went into receivership after the Games, and in 2014, the city sold the last of the condos here to pull itself out of debt. The bottom line here is that we've paid off the loan. Not exactly. The city never got back more than $100 million it was owed by the developer. After the games, due to sluggish condo sales, people started calling the village a ghost town. But even the dark days weren't all that dark. The deserted look attracted a certain clientele that helped keep businesses afloat. Because it was an empty village, every science fiction show was, was filming here. And so our core customer for about the first three months was Supernatural, Psych. Uh, you would have like aliens one day and then you'd have vampires the next day. It was so much fun. Today, the village looks like what planners envisioned, a sustainable neighborhood where patios are packed and the waterfront is clogged with cyclists and joggers. But remarkable success. In it didn't happen immediately, but they say the wait was worth it. No matter how fast something springs out of the ground, people still have unreasonable expectations about how fast things will work perfectly. So I've always said, be patient, watch it evolve over time. And frankly, it's evolved into a success story much quicker than even I expected. And like any good story, the tension at the beginning and the middle sets the stage for a happy ending. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Vancouver. The CBC's Go Public has obtained disturbing jailhouse surveillance video. It documents the 18 grueling hours an Alberta man was locked up in an RCMP drunk tank. As Rosa Marcatelli from our Go Public reports, officers thought the man was drunk when in reality he was having a stroke that left him half paralyzed in jail, according to a lawsuit. In graphic detail, the video shows how Alan Rule went from being alert to struggling to stand, repeatedly falling down, then left lying on the concrete floor, one side of his body paralyzed by a stroke and virtually ignored by RCMP, says a lawsuit. You're alone, you're cold, you don't know why you're there. And, you know, with people that are supposed to help you, you don't know why you're there. I actually thought I was going to die at one point. And the thing that scared me is that I was going to die alone. Rule was arrested by Airdrie RCMP for public intoxication in 2015 after a bar employee called police saying he was drunk and acting strangely, despite only being served water at the bar. But instead of sobering up, the video shows Rule's condition getting worse. 12 hours pass before anyone enters his cell to physically check on him. That officer pokes his head in for a few seconds. I don't blame the RCMP for, for picking him up. Um, he probably did look like he was intoxicated. Now, if they had just been watching him when he was in there, they would have noticed that something wasn't right, something wasn't adding up. 17 hours after being locked up, another officer goes in, realizes Rule can't stand, and then calls paramedics. A neurologist report says Rule may have suffered an initial stroke before his arrest that could have been confused for intoxication, then a massive one while in custody, adding it's difficult to say what impact earlier medical attention would have had. RCMP dispute all the allegations and deny any responsibility for what happened to Rule, saying there were no obvious signs he was in medical distress. But this expert in policing hired by Rule's lawyer says the evidence strongly suggests officers ignored their own operating procedures. I think there's some major lapses here, uh, beginning with how Mr. Rowe was uh, classified as a severely impaired person. 
uh, kept with that assumption uh, for the next 18 hours, uh, in spite of evidence that there's a person undergoing a medical crisis. The former offshore drilling consultant who had no plans to retire before a stroke is hoping the lawsuit will help him pay his bills, saying he and his wife of 36 years are struggling financially. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Okay, so I was out of town for a little bit, but I hear it was a bit of a mixed bag, and Brett is here now with apparently some good news. Yeah, well, I just want to welcome you back and say thank you for bringing the sunshine with you, because on behalf of everyone here, <laughs> we could definitely use a little more of that in our lives. As you look at the satellite and radar, there is a little bit of cloud right now, but in terms of any type of precipitation, we're not seeing it, and we are not going to be seeing it for a couple of days. Temperatures, we did only get up to about 7 degrees today at the airport, and right now, going down to about 3 degrees, this is indicative of the trend right Right now we're going to be seeing clearer skies not only during the day which will mean lots of sunshine by mid-afternoon and temperatures around 7 but at nighttime those clear skies means all that heat's going to be going away and it's going to be keeping things very close to the freezing mark and I'll have more on the forecast when I come back. We'll talk to you soon thanks Brett. You're welcome. And recognition today for the crew of a Canadian peacekeeping mission that set sail nearly 50 years ago. HMCS Terra Nova left for Vietnam, packed with 250 sailors who learned they'd be leaving just three days earlier. Very important because we were left in without notice and it was hurt on a lot of people, a lot of families, but it's good that we're doing it on family day. It's almost a tear, probably will be. It's a great experience to be able to come back together with the guys that we sail with. Terra Nova's crew was in Vietnam to help oversee the end of the war and evacuate Canadians. They were initially told they'd be back in three months, but the deployment actually lasted more than five. Many of the crew members were presented with service medals today to honour their contributions. And I just want to remind you, tomorrow is Budget Day here in B.C., kind of a big day. It's all happening at the provincial legislature in Victoria, where the NDP will unveil its spending priorities. So what is changing for you, and will you have to spend more or maybe less in the coming months to a year? Mike and I will have all of the coverage tomorrow night here at 6 o'clock. Tensions are high across the country. Blockades and protests over a B.C. pipeline are causing more disruptions today. We'll take you to the front lines after the break. Well, the Bank of Canada wants to know who you think should be the next person on the $5 bill. Sir Wilfred Laurier is being replaced. And, well, in Port Coquitlam, there's only one answer, and you can probably guess it. It's Terry Fox. As Jesse Johnston reports, the city is throwing its full support behind the campaign. Good morning, Port Coquitlam! In Port Coquitlam, who's the greatest Canadian has never been much of a debate. Terry Fox. It's the city's favourite son. He's ingrained in this city, and it's just something, like, really cool to be known, this like, to have this city known for Terry Fox. Across the country, but especially here in Port Coquitlam, Fox's name came up immediately when the Bank of Canada announced it's looking for a new face to replace Sir Wilfrid Laurier on the $5 bill. Obviously, this is Terry's hometown. And now this Port Coquitlam councillor says the Fox for Fiverr campaign has the city's full support. Our Mayor Brad West has written a letter to the Governor of the Bank of Canada. He's also written a letter to the Finance Minister. We've encouraged all of our citizens to go online and nominate Terry for the $5 bill. It's been almost 40 years since Fox ran nearly a marathon a day for 143 days to raise money to find a cure for cancer, the disease that took his leg, and in 1981, the disease that took his life. I was just inspired by what he was doing. The Terry Fox Foundation has raised more than $750 million for cancer research, and run organizers say putting his face on the $5 bill could be a huge fundraising tool. For him to be on the $5 bill, the Fox Fiverr would be a great way to honour him and also maybe remind us that maybe it's time again for us to dip into our pockets to uh, give a little bit more to, to help bring an end to cancer. Fox is bound to receive some tough competition. The Bank of Canada is accepting nominations until March 11th from all over the country. But in his hometown, there's only one name that will do. I'd like it. It's a unique idea. It pays tribute to a very distinct person of Canadian interest. He did a lot for the country in unity, plus what he did for cancer. Connie's a Canadian hero. 
Um, he's someone that we can all kind of aspire and, and, and be inspired by. Fox has inspired many over the last 40 years. We gotta have heroes. And in his hometown, they won't give up until they can carry Fox's face with them in their wallets. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Port Coquitlam. A lot of competition, but of course, a lot of support behind Terry Fox. We've seen that over a number of years with all the donations that are rolling in. So if you want to have your say uh, for who should be on Canada's next $5 bill, all you have to do is go to bankofcanada.ca. And we'll be back in just a few moments with what's making headlines across the country. Perhaps it's a sign of how serious this latest round of pipeline protests across Canada have become. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has cancelled a diplomatic trip to Barbados to keep his attention on ending the blockades in support of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs here in B.C. Olivia Stefanovic takes a look at what the government is doing. All hands on deck. Key ministers called in to address the demonstrations across the country. But in the end, no one had much of an update. We've understood the impact. We had a productive meeting. So we're going to continue to work very hard to resolve this peacefully as quickly as possible. The Prime Minister cancelled a trip abroad to deal with a growing domestic crisis. I understand how uh, worrisome this is for so many Canadians and difficult uh, for many people and families across the country. We're going to continue to focus on resolving this situation quickly and peacefully, and that's what we're going to do. Despite today's meeting, protests continue across the country, and tents remain by the tracks. I'm doing that for my children, my grandchildren. The Mohawks of Tyndanaga have been camping beside the main CN rail line that runs from Montreal to Toronto for the past 12 days. Their demand that RCMP leave Wet'suwet'en territory puts Ottawa in a tough spot. The government says it doesn't direct police operations, Still, political calls are growing for the Prime Minister to solve this. It's unacceptable uh, that we cannot give services to passengers and for our goods also, for our economy. These are important issues. And what I've long been calling for is that we need the federal government to play a, a role. You'll also hear that sentiment back at the Mohawk camp. I think Justin should come down here and talk to all of the First Nations and have a meeting and figure this out. And any solution needs to be a lasting one. And don't change it 10 years from now or next year so we're all back out here again. We should all be at home with our families instead of everybody standing out on this, this side street here. The focus now, what's going to happen in the next few days and can a peaceful resolution be achieved? Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Tyndanega. And as pressure mounts on the government, Canadians are really starting to feel the effects of the rail blockades. Thomas Dagla has more on how demonstrations are dragging down the economy and disrupting daily lives. Consider this one big backlog. Dozens of ships in the port of Vancouver stuck, waiting to be unloaded or filled with cargo. A sign rail disruptions are causing wide-ranging repercussions from coast to coast. In Halifax, most goods would normally be moving in and out of the port by train, but here too, all those containers are left stranded. Elsewhere, some cargo is now being sent by road, but Canada's trucking industry has this warning. There's not enough trucks and drivers to assist the railway sector or the Canadian economy. It's especially worrying for those heating their homes with propane. On the East Coast, it's being rationed in the dead of winter. Understand, you know, this isn't an inconvenience. This is causing real harm. In Atlantic Canada and Quebec, 85% of propane is normally sent by rail, and never before has the industry ground to a halt like this. Right now, there's nothing. So the, obviously, from a customer's perspective, this is really terrible. From one province to another, the rail disruptions could lead to fuel price hikes, food shortages, and more layoffs if national supply chains remain upended. 
Already, CN Rail is sending home 450 workers, with another 500 facing layoffs if the crisis drags on. The cost to the economy after 12 days, estimated in the hundreds of millions. Every hour that we delay resolving this and going back to, to normal means that increased costs the Canadian economy, increased problems for ordinary citizens across the country. At the heart of Canada's busiest rail corridor, as those trains remain stuck, the economy is slowed. There's no telling when either one will get back up to full speed. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Toronto. Another retailer is shutting its doors in Canada. Pier 1 Imports has more than 50 stores in this country, many here in BC, and all of them are going to close. There's no word on exactly when that's happening or how many jobs will be affected. The home goods chain has filed for bankruptcy protection in the U.S. and will try to sell retail locations there. It has about 1,000 stores across North America. The company has been struggling with increased competition from online retailers. Well, imagine being switched at birth. Sounds like a Hollywood movie, right? Well, it's reality for one Canadian couple. We'll have their story after the break.
Tuesday on the early edition, schools are shifting away from giving out letter grades, but how do you know how your child is measuring up without them? Amy Bell takes a look at that on her latest parental guidance column tomorrow on the early edition. Unprecedented flooding is wreaking havoc across Britain after a powerful weekend storm. Hundreds of homes have been flooded and evacuations are ongoing. Travel is also disrupted right across the UK. The storm brought so much rain on Saturday, some rivers are still rising. Now, this is the second major storm to hit the region in as many weeks, and there's more rain in the forecast. Now, we, of course, have had a lot of rain. Certainly Nothing have. like that, though. Fortunately, not yet. I mean, we'll get into that melt season soon. But for now, no, it's a completely opposite story. We're dealing with sunny skies and, you know, Wonderful. mild temperatures. <laughs> this is pretty good, I have to say. That's awesome. So thank I'll you again for bringing it yeah, back. This I is do awesome. What I can. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look back to see how this morning played out. And yeah, we're going to get a little bit of a taste of that here. You can see the sun actually rising for once instead of being a little bit of that uh, car wash effect that I think has been pretty common over here in Vancouver, at least for the next little while. And I mentioned about these dry conditions that are coming, and this is really all thanks to this dominant ridge, this area of high pressure off the coast of BC. Now, we haven't seen this a lot throughout this month or this winter at all. So to once it makes its way on shore, that means that for the remainder of today into tomorrow, and really the vast majority of this week, you won't need your umbrella. You won't need your rain gear at all. If anything, you're probably just gonna need some sunglasses. The exception to this is gonna be on Wednesday, there is a storm coming for the very far northwest, including places like Haida Gwaii and Prince Rupert, but the rest of the province is going to be quite dry. Temperatures in the south for tomorrow, pretty close to seasonal, and even come Thursday or Wednesday, rather, for Abbotsford, could be pushing double digits. And if you like a taste of spring skiing, well, certainly at our North Shore Mountains, it is going to be looking good. Now, for our five-day forecast, something that I do love to show you here, we're looking at three days in a row of relative sunshine, temperatures right where they should be, and again, in classic Vancouver fashion, Rain probably coming back on the weekend because, you know, it loves to do that. Mike's not going to like that. No, he's all. not at all. It's a good thing he didn't see that <laughs> no yet. No kidding. <laughs> all right, kind of a crazy story. An East Coast couple has come forward with a second story about babies switched at birth in Newfoundland. Yeah, as Mark Quinn tells us, their mix-up happened in 1962, the same year as another one at the very same hospital. So me and Mom were talking and looking at the baby, and I said, Mom, you don't look like my baby. The first thing she said was, how come you didn't know your own baby? <laughs> I said, very good. Oh, I was right to death. I was thinking, well, what if he didn't have his band on his arm? And I was, it scared me. Muriel Stringer sensed something was wrong when she was halfway home from the Come By Chance Hospital in 1962. My baby had dark hair, a lot of dark hair, and a nose like me, <laughs> and uh, and a little pointed nose. The nose didn't look right to me. And when they arrived at their home in Hodges Cove, her mother confirmed her suspicions. When she took the sweater off, she said, oh my, it's not your baby. It's little boy Adams. The baby was wearing an armband that had the words Baby Boy Adams written on it. That's right. Stringer's husband, Cecil, called the hospital right away and spoke with a nurse. She told me on the, on, on the phone that uh, Stringer was, was there, baby, baby boy Stringer was, yeah. was there in the hospital. Yeah. Cecil rushed back to come by chance to pick up their boy, Kent Stringer. Oh my, <laughs> yeah, I was happy, <laughs> yeah. He was a sweet boy, he still is. The Stringer mix-up happened in August 1962, just months before Craig Avery and Clarence Hines were sent home with the wrong families. The Stringer story had a happy ending, but Hines and Avery, who didn't find out they were switched until they were in their mid-50s, say what happened to them caused indescribable anguish. You never got to be there, special occasions and stuff like that with your brothers and sisters and you never got to grow up with them. It's hard. Hines and Avery are suing Eastern Health claiming negligence. Last week the Health Authority filed a statement of defense 
It says it's not responsible for what happened at the Come By Chance Hospital more than 50 years ago, and it's asking a judge to dismiss the suit with costs. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Scary situation, yeah. always a parent's worst nightmare. I'm well, sure. that's exactly what I was thinking, and I, really, to have it happen twice in the same year, craziness. <laughs> All right, that's it for our program tonight. You can always find us online, cbc.ca slash bc. And Denver, it's here at 11 o'clock after the National. Have a great night.